This is Kim Meyer, host of Choose to Rise. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Liz Colburn, host of the Morning Uplift here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you are done with this episode, I hope you'll come back and check out my show, The Morning Uplift, where we talk about finding your beauty in the journey. A new show comes out twice a month on the first and third Mondays. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of The Morning Uplift. Thank you again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Welcome to Beauty and Headcanons, where we're nerdy and you probably are too. I'm Elizabeth and I'm here today with Emily and Lindsay and we're here to talk nerdy to you. Um, Today we thought we would take a little break from all the happenings in the nerd world and talk a little bit about characters, notably some of our favorites and the actors and actresses who made us fall in love with them and others who maybe made us fall out of love. Our episodes are brought to you by Squadcast, and we're so excited to announce that they are now out of beta and fully released. With each of us living in a different time zone, Squadcast makes it easy for us to record and still make it sound like we're in the same room. Use our code, all caps, TALKNERDY, for 50% off of your first month of Squadcast. Check out our affiliate link on our show's page at publichousemedia.org. All right, so let's get into some of our favorite actors that made us fall into or out of love with characters we want to clarify though we're not trying to like downplay any actors or actresses performances at all we're our intention with this is more to give um credit where credit is due for the actors and actresses that did an exceptional job at doing their job that you know if an actor portrayed somebody that was supposed to be hated and you actually hated them that's doing a good job or if an actor portrayed somebody you were supposed to really enjoy it, that then they did a good job so just to, wanted to clarify we're not trying to you know bash on any actors or actresses here we're, we want to we want to like exemplify people who did a fantastic job and did their job well yeah and especially like even in the cases where maybe we fell out of love with a character usually there's you know like extenuating circumstances because of that it's not always just the performance sometimes it's the script the movie the editing you know, some usually there's something going on with it where, you know, it just doesn't hit you right. And you're like, you know what? I really don't like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, or, or like even some, some direction that maybe the actors, you know, followed the director's uh, opinion. And that's just kind of how it came out. And we're like, ah, not happy with the way that came out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, it just kind of, you know, Sometimes the performance comes out due to a lot of different factors. And so it's not necessarily that we're bashing on the actors or actresses. We just, you know. I actually wanted to mention, I was listening to David Tennant's podcast um, recently, and he and Olivia Coleman are talking about how all of the roles that she's had so recently, she's been playing really well. She's been nominated for a few um, awards recently. And he says something to her about, oh, well, I mean, you obviously were the best at playing that you were you were the, the absolute best and she's really humble um during the podcast she's like well other people may have been able to do just as good a job and he said but they didn't <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's kind of poignant in this to to say you know these are the people who we know and love in these roles and they really became those characters for us in, in one way or another yeah exactly And sometimes it's just like a perfect storm where everything comes together just right. And sometimes it's kind of the opposite where it, everything just does not come together at all. My first one is very like popular, well-known character. And that's Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Before I saw Tom Holland in the role, like I was kind of neutral on Spider-Man. I didn't hate him, but at the same time, it's like, eh, like I, I could take him or leave him. It's not a big deal for me. And for somebody who is a Marvel fan, who loves the comics and everything like that, it, you know, people kind of look at you funny, like, oh, you don't really like, you don't like Spider-Man? But, you know, my first introduction to him was Tobey Maguire, which I was like, eh, not that entertaining. 
uh, I was just, especially by the second Spider-Man movie, I, I really wasn't excited so much so that I didn't even bother with Andrew Garfield's performance. But I ended up seeing Tom Holland initially in Civil War and then in Homecoming and Infinity War. And I just completely fell in love with Spider-Man. Now I am a huge Spider-Man fan. I've like gone back to several of his different comics just so I can read them. Because now with this performance, I have Tom Holland doing this performance, you know, and delivering the lines and doing the action. I have that in my head. And to me, that makes like a huge world of difference as opposed to Tobey Maguire and his rendition of Spider-Man. Yeah, it was kind of the same for me. Like, not that Tobey Maguire did a bad job. I'm sure he was, you know, doing, uh, I mean, he was doing his best work and he was doing, you know, what his directors and producers and everyone wanted him to do. But I think the way Tom Holland portrayed Spider-Man, like, truly captured who Spider-Man is for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, and it, it was hard to warm up to him for me. I The first uh, movie we see him in, I was like, oh, I don't really know how I feel about this. But <laughs> by, by the second movie, I was like, yep, this this is this is the Spider-Man that that we that I wanted the whole time. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I feel that happened a lot with uh, some other Marvel character as well. The Hulk. Uh, yeah. Mark Ruffalo is yeah is i would agree my bruce banner i cannot yes. even handle edward norton not that he did a bad job just that his portrayal didn't speak to me the way mark ruffalo's did mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i would I, I would agree I think for a lot of people with with the marvel cinematic universe too i think there that might have been a reason why they changed to mark ruffalo <laughs> as well but yeah. i mean because he i think he just really suits the role mm -hmm. and that's just kind of probably how it is for a lot of these characters that we're going to talk about with a lot with a lot of the actors and actresses because this you know some people really just fall into a role and they fit it so perfectly you know when you're looking at the credits on a movie and or a show and the the letters that come after someone who was in charge of casting i always wanted to, to give them a ton more credit than they probably ever get because yeah can you imagine being them and have and and having this burden of having to cast the perfect people <laughs> For, for the director's vision yeah oh my goodness i've thought about that a lot too because there's so many different factors that goes into that like you know the budget and like maybe the producers and the directors have certain visions and right. so you have to take that and take all that into consideration and mm -hmm. oh that's it's not really a job i would want that that seems really high no, I, I always wanted to like be them you know i always wanted to be someone <laughs> who was able to be part of that vision but they they must have such a weighty job to have to uh -huh. take the vision and what's planned and what you couldn't possibly plan for to take right. someone off the streets and turn them into um, an actor for a role that someone knows doesn't know loves doesn't love there's so many different aspects that go into that i would i would just love to find someone and pick their brain as to how that happens that's that's a goal we should find a casting person and like interview them that would be amazing <laughs> i want to do it um no seriously though like i i also wonder like how much bearing a director's word has on who actually gets cast you know because sometimes mm. i feel like it's a lot of times the director's word is law yeah but at the oh. same time like the casting director is a type of director so i mean and they're the ones in charge of it. So right. I don't know. I'm sure there's a ton of coll collaboration there. Like I said, I would just be so interested to see that process. I'd love to be like in the room for all the auditions. Uh -huh. oh, oh, yeah. That'd be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there's so much footage of people's audition tapes and stuff. Because people love to watch that kind of thing. It's great. Right. Well, you hear about these amazing situations that happened. Um, young kids who just fell into roles or... The, the ones that were at Juilliard or the ones who uh, worked really hard. And then there's, you know, we've, we've spoken about people who were found folding laundry at a t-shirt shop. Like I, right. all of that is, is just so amazing to me being in the right place at the right time or um, working so hard to get the role of a lifetime. Um, it's the look of the draw or not. And I just love it. Yeah. It's so interesting. Because one of mine is Tom Felton as Draco Malfoy. That's really the only thing I've seen him in. But he is in a new show. I think it's a sci-fi type show now. 
it's a newer one um but anyways draco malfoy especially in harry potter and the sorcerer's stone just you love to hate draco mm -hmm. in that first movie especially but then like moving on into the series like you kind of start to feel bad for him a little bit because you get to know his family a little bit more but in that first movie he did such a great job of being the kid you wanted to hate yeah i think he did a good job with like you know in the first movies like you're kind of like definitely not like not in love with him but like by the um by the later movies especially like the sixth and seventh mm -hmm. movie like you really start to feel with him and you start to actually fall in love with him for in a way yeah because there is there's development there which also goes to show his acting you know because mm -hmm. you, you, he started out as this kid that you just you, you can't stand him you know like he does all these nasty things and says stuff that you just you want to smack him and yeah he has a certain right. kind of passion yeah throughout the series yeah i remember um the particularly the scene in uh the half blood prince where he's in the bathroom and he's like basically like you know leaning over the sink and talking to himself in the mirror like trying to you know gas himself up and like you uh -huh. know keep himself together while he's you know basically like stressing out trying to figure out this cabinet situation yeah and he's just like having this little breakdown when Harry walks in. And I just really, really love that moment because it's one of the first times where you really see like the real Draco Malfoy. Because like before, it's kind of like this mask of this Malfoy mask where he's just like, oh, this perfect, you know, upstanding, pure blood and pure blood and tough kid. Like, that... you, see him as, you know, who he is. You know, he's a kid who has just all this you know, pressure put on him, you know, whether he deserves it or not. And, you know, he's trying to cope. Yeah. Yeah. And, he, you know, his parents expect perfection from him. And so he has to appear like this unflappable kind of guy. But like, whenever that there's that pressure, it has to go somewhere, you know? Yeah. I uh, wanted to talk about Edward James Olmos. I love him and everything he's in um, that I've seen, but he is the epitome of Admiral William Adama in Battlestar Galactica. Um, and I know you guys can't really like nerd out with me about this one, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I do love Edward James almost. He is really cool. Yeah. I mean, even he also plays um, a bad guy in Dexter and I just loved the betrayal of him in both of those parts but again even when he was in dexter i was seeing admiral adama so it, it it was just the most pivotal role for me for him to play i can't imagine admiral adama being anybody else you know like i suppose you, you would feel that way about several different people though too and i just loved him i, I felt so much compassion for him i just wanted good things for him and I really do attribute that to to his betrayal of the character, for sure. I'm not sure who he is, so sorry. <laughs> I mean, you can't all be perfect, Emily. So I know, I I'm sorry. <laughs> it was almost awesome. He, yeah. he, what he, else is he in besides those? One of those that just like, you know, you, you know, obviously I, I think there's probably like a role like almost everybody recognizes him in like immediately like you do, Lindsay, but... He's one of those actors that just, like, he's been in so much and he's so versatile that, you know, you could have seen him in just about anything. And, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, that's him. <laughs> and and that's, who I, that's just who I recognize him as now. <laughs> um, he usually plays, like, a Mexican uh, cartel or something like that. He's played um, Mayans. He was in Blade Runner. Uh yeah, so I remember him from Narcos. Oh, okay. I haven't seen I haven't yeah. seen those, but I've I I know the names of it. So, gotcha. He, he's an Agents of Shield. Um, okay. Yeah. But probably I, some I kind of random things that you might not even expect. Yeah, either. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, cool. I mean, his his most known role would have to be Battlestar Galactica for sure. Okay. There's I mean, because that was, there, that was but... like a, a consistent role for several seasons. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Every season. Well, my next um, person is a voice actor, technically, but I'm still counting him for this list because he really helped kind of shape my geekiness in a way, at least for the DC universe. Um, and that is Kevin Conroy, who has 
voiced Batman in Batman the Animated Series and tons and tons of other Batman media throughout the years. Nice. <laughs> and the reason like I picked him is because like up until I actually saw um, Batman the Animated Series in the late 90s, um, previous to that, like really my only actual experience with Batman was unfortunately the Clooney Batman. And so like, I didn't really take Batman as being all that or all that serious or something that I would really be interested in. But I started watching Batman, the animated series. And I was just like, okay, I I get it now. (laughs) You know, like I, I really understand the character. I, I understand the whole world that he operates in now. Like everything just kind of clicked once I heard him as Batman. And now when I read the comics, his voice is the voice that I hear in my head when like I'm reading Batman comics. That's awesome. Yeah. I watched a couple episodes of that and I would say, yeah, like he, he does sound like the iconic Batman that you would imagine. So my next one, um, he, he has so many roles and (laughs) does a fantastic job in every role. But the one I'm specifying is David Tennant as the doctor in Dr. Who. Um, just because, I, I I started watching Doctor Who like excited to see him as the doctor because I knew him from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire as Barty Crouch Jr. And he did such a good job as that. Like you just knew he was like this nasty guy, but he was <laughs> like, you know, Barty Crouch is Barty Crouch Jr. was a, you know, it's a bad, bad guy in the movie or in, you know, in, in the books, he was written as a bad guy, of course. And, you know, he was, supposed to be hated and i was i was so interested to see him in something else and so when i saw him you know i i I watched nine uh i watched uh christopher eccleson and he was good he was good but david Tennant was what i was waiting for so Mm -hmm. i was so excited when i finished that season and got to david Tennant's seasons and i was like oh yes i've made it and it was just fantastic and i was hooked yeah, so I'm going to just piggyback on that one. David Tennant as Kilgrave was just oh. so scary and so mm-hmm. maniacal and, and terrifying, wonderful, and all the things. I, I agree yeah. with you about him being the doctor. I absolutely loved him. But I definitely, uh, everything I've seen him in, I'm just in awe of, of how he brings those those characters to to life. I also watched him in Broadchurch and it was hard really to get used to the Scottish accent because I was having a really hard time with that. (laughs) I was so used to him as a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was difficult for me, but it was so much fun to watch him. And the the things he's doing right now, you know, Scrooge McDuck and all of the other things that we that we're seeing. And what is that one? Good omens? Good Omens coming is coming soon. out. I've yeah. seen pictures. It does look very interesting. I'm not mm-hmm. sure how I'm going to feel about it. He does look like he has red hair in it. Yes, which I is did hear that. It makes him look <laughs> gaunter than he is, which is a feat in of itself. Right, because yeah. Because he's a tall, gaunt guy. So I guess the doctor is finally a ginger, huh? Yeah, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> the, the talent just like oozes out of the man. So I'm, it, it, yeah. Yeah, I'm super excited to see everything he's in yeah he's one of those guys that no matter who he plays he can either make you love him or hate him exactly it gets the job done man the role yep (laughs) and then talking about gingers um eddie redmayne is my uh next pick i just absolutely love him as newt scamander in fantastic beasts again i just can't imagine anyone else playing the role now that we've seen him in two movies and um, beforehand yeah. reading Fantastic Beasts, I didn't have like a a face or a description or anything to know. Yeah. And now that I do, I can't unsee it. Like I can't unsee it. I can't unthink it. It's just Eddie Redmayne, whether I like it or not. Yep. No, exactly. <laughs> same same for me. And apparently he's like a really amazing actor. I have a friend who's told me I need to watch uh, The Theory of Everything and I just haven't managed to do it yet. So I've heard of that too. Now I'm, oh yeah, he was Stephen Hawking in The Theory of Everything. And I, you know, I, I heard about the movie and just kind of never got around to seeing it. But I, I, I'm so interested because he, he plays, you know, you'll see him in like interviews and stuff and he's interacting like, you know, a regular person but in his role as newt he's very like closed off and and reserved and yeah 
Exactly. And so I, in, as Stephen Hawking, I would guess you'd have to be like Stephen Hawking, obviously. So, I mean, I love that he can, he can portray characters that are so different like that. Well, my next pick is one that I think I mentioned on one of our previous episodes that I think has just been done to death. Yes, um, you did mention but, that. But um, that is Jared Leto as the Joker. And I mean, there, there's been so many iterations of the Joker. I don't necessarily mind all the different iterations, but this particular one just, it really did not jive with me. It really didn't seem to encompass what the Joker is, who he is, what he does. Like, because even with all the different uh, ways that, you know, he's been portrayed, whether mm-hmm. that's with Jack Nicholson, whether it's with Heath Ledger, whether it's with Mark Hamill, mm-hmm. you know, there's always, you know, this little essence of the Joker that remains the same, even if, yeah. you know, the individual portrayals are different. And I didn't really see that hmm. in this one. You know, everything that he did, you know, to his co-stars and everything like that, I, all of that aside... I, I just didn't really find it that impressive. And I, I feel like they could have just, well, I mean, I, I think the whole movie could have used a really serious rewrite, but I think they could have put another person in that role or another character in that role that he was trying to, fulf- that they were trying to fulfill with the Joker. And I think it would have been a lot better whether, you know, instead of just falling back on this one character that, uh-huh. oh, everybody knows because yeah. he's the Joker, you know? Well, and you know, I've seen a couple of other loose portrayals of the joker as well um with gotham even oh sure Uh, and i feel like you're right there's a certain kind of essence that's always there um Mm -hmm. unfortunately i didn't see well maybe fortunately now that you've said (laughs) it but i haven't seen suicide squad um i just didn't have any interest in it i didn't really feel like I don't know. DC is not my thing. I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it either for the record, but I don't know. DC animated is much, much better. Yeah. I well, gotcha. it's just sort of like, I just don't, I can't get into Joker. I, I feel like there's something there that I can't understand. So I don't really try. But honestly, if you want to go for a Suicide Squad movie, I would highly recommend the animated movie Assault on Arkham mm. because they in that animated movie, uh, the Joker does make an appearance. It's not a very big one, but they really encompass everything that the Suicide Squad is, all of the different characters and them coming together and, you know, figuring out their different, you know, the dynamics of working together as a team. So, yeah. And I just, I I didn't feel it from the previews of the movie. I just didn't Mm -hmm. have any inclination to watch it, but the, the portrayals that I have seen of, of Joker. Um, I guess Jack Nicholson would probably be my penultimate. I just think he's great. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah. It's definitely not a bad one to have. <laughs> I was so scared when I was, you know, my daughter's age at the time. So I feel like that was <laughs> enough for me. That, yep. That, that would probably do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. My next pick, I have another Harry Potter character. Um, Mm. But they're just so well cast. I loved (laughs) Maggie Smith as Minerva McGonagall. Like, she is Minerva to me. Kind of like how, Mm. you know, I I, I just can't see anybody else play Minerva McGonagall. I love her. And, like, just the fact that, like, in the filming of the last Harry Potter movies, she was going through cancer treatment, and she still went to all the rehearsals and did her roles and everything. I'm like, that's amazing. Yeah. It's Maggie Smith, and she does her thing. And, like, you know, when she's just – the way she says Harry Potter is perfect. It's every time. (laughs) You know he's in trouble. (laughs) Now that when I see her in other roles, I always go back to her as Minerva McGonagall. I always – Oh, well, maybe she was just always Minerva McGonagall, and this was <laughs> her playing other people. Yes, and we'll talk about the uh, theory we have later. Um, but just, uh, I can't unsee her as Minerva McGonagall, and she was just so perfect for that role, I think. So she did a yeah, fantastic definitely. job. And what a force to be reckoned with that she's uh, going through chemotherapy at the same I time. I know. Uh, I'm just impressed. All right. My next to last one is another one where I kind of fell out of love. And um, that was Anna Paquin as Rogue in the X-Men, the initial X-Men movies that came out. You know, I, I had seen the animated um, series from uh, 
from X-Men, like the original animated series from the early 90s, the good ones. <laughs> and so I, I already, you know, obviously had, you know, this kind of picture in my mind of these characters, not not necessarily how they looked, but like how they acted and how they interacted with each other. And Anna Paquin was one of those that just kind of threw me because I don't know, maybe it was because they made her so much younger than she was really supposed to be. Maybe, I don't know. It was just really, really weird. And that, and I'm sorry, but she can't do a seven accent to save her life. Ugh. It did not get that much better in True Blood. Oh, I was about to say, can we talk about Sookie Stackhouse for a second? <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. No, and I yeah, saw so... I saw X Men the regular, you know, the the first X Men. I think I've seen one, two, and three, but I don't remember two and three very well. But I've definitely seen one a few times, and she, her character in there just she seemed very forced when mm -hmm. she was acting, and I just don't know what it was. Yeah. I can agree with that. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was like maybe the expectations put on her, yeah, or if maybe it was the dissonance between what they how they were writing Rogue in the movie, and I don't know if she you know went back and read any comics yeah. or looked at any other media Doing of Rogue and was character. trying to like balance it or something. yeah, like her character know. study would didn't quite match up with the way she was directed or something. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, and I and I usually love love Rogue. Yeah, so that was just like I, I was. Yeah, I was disappointed. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, with this one too, I feel like I sort of just forgot that was her playing that character. <laughs> I didn't. Now that I read it and I think about it, yeah, absolutely. But I, I agree completely. I just didn't feel it. Kind of like um, similar feeling for me with Halle Berry as Storm. Just and again, going back to the animated series, hmm. she had such presence. Like I kind of would have expected somebody similar to Angela Bassett to be cast as Storm mm. just because she has that 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 essence around her that just makes her stand out no matter what and it was just like eh, you know she, she's she's well, there this kind of goes back to what we we're talking about with casting too I wonder if it was um those particular people because they also had Hugh Jackman you know like I, I wonder. yeah it, it was like a, a name thing almost like oh well we should yeah. have Halle Berry like not this and Halle Berry is great, sure. but maybe not for that role. I'm sure yeah. there's a whole lot of other things involved in in all yeah. of this and yeah, and absolutely all other aspects. But I I think it's very interesting to think about the other people that we could have seen in the role as well, mm -hmm. and yeah. whether or not they would have been directed or um, able to be directed in a different way or mm -hmm. in a way that would be more pleasing to whoever. Yeah, and it's yeah. so interesting because there's a lot that goes on in movie making that we as the viewers don't actually get to be a part of or get to see. And so it's really hard to say, like, if it was anybody's fault particularly at all. But just the, the the portrayal of it, you know, we see the face of the actor or actress on the screen, and that's that's the, that's what we get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's who we tend to blame. No, exactly. And it's hard to actually blame anybody else because we wouldn't know who. Yeah. Because there's so Even many. It's not necessarily their fault. Maybe they're just, yeah. you know, doing the best with what they're given. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Know. So, like, yeah. It's so it's so hard to say that. But but um, my one of my next ones is, uh, I guess, I, yeah, I have two left. Um, one that I just... He, again, plays so many different characters um, in a lot of different shows and movies that I love is Mark Shepard. And ugh, everything he plays, he plays somebody that you just love to hate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just perfect. Like, that is his his wheelhouse and he mm -hmm. he really grasps that type of character, um, even even if they're a different kind of person in all of those things like I've. I personally have enjoyed him in three different things, at least. Um, I've probably seen him in several. I know he's in a lot more than that, but three that I specifically enjoy, like Firefly. He played Badger in Firefly. Mm -hmm. um, he was um, a character called Sterling in a show that I'm totally forgetting the name of right now. I'll think of it White later. Color? Not White Collar. That's the other one. He was... Um, he was his nickname was the Dutchman in White Collar, um, but his name name I forget in White Collar. But anyways, he was in all of those things. Just 
the guy that you when you see him you're like oh again <laughs> yeah or you just roll your eyes exactly like he's back i thought he was <laughs> what uh so yeah it he does a great job yeah and my last one i wanted to kind of end on a love character one that i fell in love with so i chose ben foster as the stranger from 30 days of night um now i read the graphic novel 30 days of night and i know this is probably like a smaller like in relation to you know everything we've ever, all the fandoms we've been talking about 30 days of night is like a smaller fandom but um the basic premise is that um there's a town in alaska called barrow and it experiences 30 days of complete darkness, you know, in the winter. And because of that, these group, this group of vampires decides that that would be perfect. They can go up there, they can feed, they don't have to worry about, you know, having to find somewhere to hide uh, once the sun comes up because they have 30 days, you know, free reign. And so they send um, this human that is one of, that is their ally up there called the stranger. And he basically, like, he destroys all the satellite phones. He destroys any way that they could get out or call for help or contact anyone. And, you know, so in, in the graphic novel, you know, obviously it's a very important role. And um, in the graphic novel, it's, you know, I, I obviously, you know, really enjoyed it. But when I got to see Ben Foster on screen doing this role I just immediately fell in love with it he is so wonderfully intense and creepy um I remember in the trailer they had him say this one line um about that cold ain't the weather that's death approaching and it just oh. sends shivers down your spine because it's so uh it just hits you yeah and I don't think they could have cast that any better honestly nice that that is cool. awesome, yeah. I'm not familiar with Thirty Days of Night, but it does sound a really an interesting concept. Um, hopefully, not vampires like Twilight. Um, oh no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> these are the scary yeah. kind. <laughs> oh yeah, very scary. Gotcha. And it's interesting because he has he's another one of those actors who has such a wide range. You might recognize him oh. as Angel from the Third X Men, Warren Worthington the Third, the uh. guy with the wings. That was him. If I'd have to see so a picture, it, but I'd recognize him probably. It's it's this huge change because, like, as Warren Worthington the third, he's you know just very clean cut, very you know young looking and you know good looking and everything. And then as the stranger, he's got this scraggly beard and the scraggly hair, and he looks you know just very unkempt and everything. It's I I, I honestly like didn't w didn't put two and two together that they were the same person portraying them until like I actually saw it on his IMDb. Oh man, it was. The change was just dramatic, you know? So my last actor that I have is another guy that you, you once you know that he's in a couple different things, like you'll be a little bit mind boggled, I think. Uh, another Harry Potter, but it's so good. Jason Isaacs as Lucius Malfoy is another one. You just, you just have to hate him. He's so good at it. So good at just, it. I mean, it's smarmy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, he's just this, like, mm, slimy little get-behind-your-back kind of guy. Like, mm. But then <laughs> you see him in Star Trek Discovery as Captain Gabriel Lorca. Or is it, I forget, I don't know if it's Captain or Commander or what, but he has his own ship in, in Star Trek Discovery. Um, and he is a very, like, chaotic, neutral character in that. And... So it's not necessarily that he's like a loathsome character or a lovable character, but I really love the character that he portrays. He does a fantastic job as Gabriel Lorca and he plays. So Jason Isaacs is British by you know nationality, but in Star Trek, he plays an American guy, well, an American accented guy. So at first, I didn't pick it up because he looks completely different from Lucius Malfoy, because uh, you know Lucius has the long white blonde hair and mm -hmm. you know British accent, and he's very like you know he's in his proper pure blooded wizardry robes and everything. But in Star Trek, he's in his Starfleet uniform. He has short dark black hair. And um, it's it's just so, so well done. He does a fantastic job playing that character. Yeah, I 
besides Harry Potter, one of the first things I um, I had seen him in, or rather heard him in, was Batman Under the Red Hood, because um, he actually portrays Rachel Ghoul. And, uh-huh. and there's not like a whole, whole lot of scenes with Rachel in there, but to me, he really like nails this almost otherworldliness that, you know, the character of Rache, you know, is, yeah. you know, just this, this is very old, almost ancient character that, you know, it just nothing really seems to ruffle him. Yeah. Yeah. When he was also, I believe he was also in the Patriot as one of the British mm-hmm. soldiers as well. The only reason mm-hmm. why I recognized him was because he had a white wig on. <laughs> I'm like, oh, Lucius Malfoy's in this. Cool. <laughs> But so kind of, that kind of leads us into, we have a theory to present to you guys today. Um, wouldn't it be crazy if, so we were talking about a bunch of different actors and actresses that play different roles. Um, what if it were true that, kind of like Lindsay alluded to, these actors and actresses were really all the same person, but different like you know, they're they're in different characters of uh, across multiple fandoms, but they're just different iterations of the same person across different universes, based upon like different events that happen to their in their lives in those alternate universes. And so, like Barty Crouch Jr. is the Doctor, is Alec Hardy, is Kilgrave, because David Tennant is the same guy that plays all of those characters. So like he looks the same pretty much. Like wouldn't that be like? mind-boggling a little bit (sighs) would he also be david tennant as well in another yeah okay yes (laughs) exactly that's the that's the thing like wouldn't that be crazy yeah and so like all these different movies and tv series or what you know what have you like they're basically like these different universes or Uh you know planes of dimension or whatever kind of like leaking through into our own right exactly like all of the shows or movies are like portals into these alternate universes where it's like oh that's cool and then you see like somebody that we know has a different name here but they have a uh, you know their their other name in the other universe and maybe like if there's an actor or actress that takes on a role that we don't particularly love maybe that's because they weren't really meant to have that role Uh uh-huh maybe it's like that universe was kind of a um an unstable one or maybe like when it came to casting something just messed up (laughs) (laughs) yeah yep like oopsies that would be really cool i mean it's it's kind of got the basis in string theory and the multiverse which it basically you know posits that there are multiple universes and potentially different copies of people including us like i i just have like a very you know simple layman's grasp of this mostly because i had to research it for uh, story that I was writing. <laughs> it helps. But, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, basically, depending on like different um, levels of it, I mean, the universes could be basically the same, they could be slightly different, or they could be almost unrecognizable just because the laws of physics are so different mm-hmm. that, right. you know, everything is just it's topsy turvy. Exactly. You know, we wouldn't recognize it. Yep. And I'm sure we've probably all seen glimpses of some type of sci fi show representing stuff like that. Like, I can think mm-hmm. of several Stargate episodes that does that, even bits and pieces of Doctor Who, you know? Um, I mean, of course, the, the Bad Wolf episodes at the end of yeah. um, <laughs> Rose's time. Um, but yeah, like, just, you know, things could be slightly different or completely different. Um, but yet, somehow, like, the same faces right. appear what, you know what interests me the most about it is that a version of me could be in the same uh, realm as someone like the doctor right and, um, going along your life and and being affected by the daleks and and cybermen and stuff and and that being an alternate route you could be a That's companion really of the doctor cool. what mm-hmm. Like that'd be awesome. like a choose your own adventure story if you chose every single option right but it'd be choose your own universe yeah choose your own universe like or if you like knew where each option was headed to a certain extent mm-hmm. and then like at each option you're like oh well i can take this path which will lead me here or this path which will lead me here and then you know kind of like those choose your own adventure books where it says like if you choose to do this then or like right. you know if you want this to happen but then there's other consequences that happen along the way too that we don't know about. I don't know. I like it. (laughs) 
thanks for getting nerdy with us today. We would love to know who your picks are that made you fall into or out of love with a character based off of their acting, their, their writing, anything you'd love to share with us. We would love to hear from you. Let us know on our social media if we missed anything that you wanted to add. I'm Lindsay. And I'm Emily. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for getting nerdy with us today on Beauties and Headcanons. Thank you.